Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming today. Uh, we have Aza Raskin here with us today as a Tech Talk speaker. Um, Aza's done a lot of thinking in the field of human-computer interaction, and uh, I've heard him speak in the past and thought it was quite inspiring as far as uh, thinking about new and innovative user interfaces. So we're really glad to have him here at Google today, and please welcome Aza. Oh, hello. Um, so I guess started a small software company, Humanize, to, uh, to, to bring some of the ideas of, of my father, Jeff Raskin, the person who, I guess, started the Macintosh project at Apple, um, actually out into the world. Um, so I tried to strike a balance between you know, thinking far into the future and actually like, doing pragmatic steps of what makes better interfaces palatable to people now. Um, so I hope you all have had the opportunity to not follow the instructions on the screen. Um, Most people have trouble with it. That's OK. Google people probably can't follow instructions anyway. Um, but I, I mean, this brings up a point, because I don't think people here actually had a choice in not following the instructions up here. Um, and it's not because you're bad at following instructions, but just because there are some things which are fundamental about the way people work that are tautologically true, that are the same whether you, um, no matter what language you speak, no matter uh, what context you're working in, which are true. And when you're designing interface, you have to take those into an account. So I wanted to tell a really brief story um, about how I got into doing actual interface design. Um, and it's, the, it's not your fault story. So like, you have to remember, I was, I was born um, into a family where thinking about interface design was truly, I, essentially, I was brainwashed from the youngest age. Um, I think you know, I learned to program at a really young age. That's actually the millionth Macintosh right there uh, that I was playing with. That's what that little plaque says. I mean, I was carried around inside of the like Macintosh luggable case instead of most people have strollers. I was carried around in that. <laughs> so there was no help but for me. It was my destiny to become a geek, to become a nerd. Like it was just written in stone, um, which is fine. But this is actually a problem. Um, because in interface design, well, this is what would happen. I'd try to help Jeff or my mom or grandmother use the computer, and they'd want to know how to print. And for me, it was simple. I could think the way that engineers thought or programmers thought and go ahead and do all sorts of manipulations, hit Control, Alt, P, left elbow, um, and it would work. And I'd get really frustrated at them for not being able to do the same thing. It's simple. Why can't they do it? Well. It was around, I think, maybe middle school or high school when it finally dawned on me that I was thinking about it the wrong way. It shouldn't be that I should get frustrated at the computer. I should be getting, or at the uh, person, I should get agitated at the computer. Because if people are having trouble using it, it's the computer that's at fault. So that's, that's sort of the rallying cry behind humanize is that it's not your fault. Um, so how can we go about making sure that the computer works the way that people do? Well, so Jeff spent a lot of time after working on the Mac. He always looked back at the Mac as sort of a, uh, a nice first step, but never enough. And he went into the Ken Cat, and after that, he worked on his book, The Human Interface, for a while um, to figure out why the interfaces he designed, he has he's sort of good into it, actually worked well. He wanted to change that sort of wishy washy guruism of interface design into an engineering discipline where you could have numbers. Um, so a lot of this stuff is summed up in Cognetics. Do, do most people here know that? Yes, no? OK. So Cognetics, quite simply, is what ergonomics is to the human body, Cognetics is to the human mind. Um, so it tells you things like, I don't know, uh, how many things can you hold in your short-term memory, 7 plus or minus 2. If you click a button, how fast do you have to have something happen so that the user doesn't click again? 250 milliseconds. Um, can you actually multitask? No, you end up doing task switching, and you lose time in between. Um, so it's these sorts of things which uh, Cognetics helps you understand. And when you're designing an interface, they sort of give you a very good base for making computers which are humane, that is, computers which are cognizant of our needs um, and help us with our frailties. So actually, I mean, how many people here uh, design interfaces? OK, good amount. 
Um, how, how many people here uh, know about, say, GOMS modeling? Oh, roughly the same. That's the first. Um, <laughs> um, people, OK, this one for here should probably be really good. How many people can do logarithm base 2? Yay, more. Um, how many people know how to calculate, say, information entropy? I really like this place. Um, OK, so there's this wonderful tool that actually Jeff helped come up with, which is called uh, information uh, efficiency of an interface. And you can actually calculate, given the number of bits required input over number of bits required output, to figure out how well your interface does on a grand scale, which is even better than GOMS modeling, which only tells you how fast it's going to be. So there, anyway, the point is that there are all these really cool tools out there that many of the interface designers aren't aware of. Um, for instance, just one simple thing that comes up um, is habituation. People habituate. That means you know, we, we get habits. And it's, it's a good thing, right? That means we can walk and chew gum at the same time, or at least most people can. I'm not sure if I can. Um, and it's just how we work. But if you take that as a precept, then when you're designing interfaces, you won't make some common mistakes. And one of the most common mistakes out there is the are you sure dialog boxes. Because what will happen is that people will habituate to them. They will get in the habit of always clicking yes or always clicking no. Whichever way they choose, they'll do it. So I mean, how many people in here have had that unfortunate experience of closing a, a document? It says, are you sure you want to do this? You click yes. And the split second after, you're like, oh, that's not what I meant to do. Right. But we knew that that was going to happen because people habituate. So I mean, I don't really mean to point fingers, um, Google Calendar. <laughs> Google Mail does this absolutely wonderful thing when, when you delete something, it says, oh, you can undo. Just puts it along the top. Calendar doesn't do that. So I mean, just knowing these things help you avoid those, those sort of standard pitfalls that have been kept around by social momentum. So you know, one rule that you can come up with is never use a warning when you mean undo. So that, that was, my, that was my, my introduction into interface design, is that it's not your fault. If you have a trouble with an interface, if it loses your work, it's not your fault. It's the computer's fault. You need to think about how to make the computer better. But we've made a lot of, a lot of progress, right? That's what computers looked like back in 1977 with the Xerox star. And you can chart the progress all the way up to 2007, 30 years, and you can see the immense amount of change that's happened. <laughs> Why is this? Why haven't things changed? And I'm going to make the argument that there, we, we have something called the toolkit straitjacket. Um, people generally take the path of least resistance. When you have to sit down and come up with a new product um, or come up with a new interface, you want to get it done fast. Your manager wants to get it done fast. So even if you have a great idea saying, aha, this will make it so much better to use, if it's easier to do it some other way, you'll end up doing that because it takes less time and less money. It's already proven. And so what's happened, I think, is that very early on, programmers like making these abstract tools that make doing what they do much easier. And they made these. So we have these amazing GUI toolkits that make prototyping things really fast. Um, but they also make everything the same. Some amount of consistency is good, but you cannot be better without being different. And so there's a lot of power in toolkits, but there is also a lot of danger there. Um, in particular, I think right now we've seen a lot of innovation on the web, um, a lot of great new interfaces. Um, one of my favorites is that. Uh, of you know, the ubiquitous search, which I'm clearly talking to the right audience. Um, and even better is that Gmail has finally integrated with their chat. So because what is chatting but just an email without a subject line? So these are great. But we are now seeing these toolkits start forming. YUI, you guys have a toolkit. Um, Dojo has a toolkit. And making things is becoming easier and easier and easier, making Windows in the uh, standard GUI paradigm is becoming easier and easier and easier. And people fall back on these. They, don't, they stop innovating because they say, ah, this is probably already solved. It may not be the best solution, but I can just use it. Let's go. Um, so this is just a warning that if we don't want to get stuck 
with what we had before. And if we, you have to be very careful about your toolkit. You always have to make sure that you have the freedom to move forward. It, it's, a, it's a very difficult line to walk. Um, yet another absolutely great uh, caption. So I just want to talk a little bit about interfaces and their importance. Um, I said a shovel. This is the important part of the shovel. This is your algorithm. This is your, uh, this has, you know, like a carbide blade with diamond encrusted titanium. Uh, this is the most important part. This is where you spent hundreds of millions of dollars doing your, your research into um, in R&D. And this is the interface of the shovel. This part, meh. You, you wait till the very end of your uh, development cycle to do. Um, and you, know, you, you don't spend too much money on it. You just slap a nice color blue. So uh, this is the interface that you come up with. Um, and you end up with a, a shovel, which although it has the latest technology, isn't actually all that usable. Um, this is tantamount to designing with, say, starting with a um, chip and saying, I'm going to design a computer around this chip, which is what people used to do. Um, for had the idea that you should start with a computer and design, or start with a person and design around them. And here's Microsoft's solution. Um, you know, mouse pad, wireless engine antenna. Oh, oh yeah, that's that's the shovel. Okay, but this is amusing, right? But it's actually Microsoft. It's not all Microsoft's fault, um, and I'll, I'll get back to that. So just as, as a mantra, Jeff was very fond of saying this, to the user, the interface is the product. Again, Google has done very well at this. So the general way to start is by making sure that you keep simple things simple. Um, Einstein, I think, said you should strive to make everything as simple as possible without going any further. I really don't know what that means, but it certainly sounds nice. Um, so here we go, M my favorite example. The analog versus digital watch. Um, to illustrate just how bad the digital watch is, um, and why we're, I think it was Douglas Adams that talked about how pleased we all were for having digital watches. Um, but we shouldn't be. Here, I went to the Timex website to get the manual for the uh, for the digital watch. And this is what it was. It went all the way from top to bottom. Simple, right? You should be able to describe that over the phone. There should be no reason why somebody has a problem using that watch. Until you look at the exact same manual for the analog watch. So whenever I'm designing an interface, I often like to start with the manual. Because if you start with the manual, and you realize that you're having trouble describing how your system is going to work, that probably means your user is going to have trouble using that system. Um, and again, why, if it's so much easier to use an analog watch, why do digital watches still have such a bad interface? It's because of social momentum, because that's the way it was done. That's the way it's easy. That's the way that's cheap. It's just four buttons. Those are the toolkits you have. And coming with something better really takes work. OK, so some other things that aren't simple. Uh, cell phones, I mean, they're a long way to go. Uh, it used to be uh, that taking a picture on a cell phone was a laborious process, where you have to go through, digging through many menus before you could get to the right thing. You'd click a button, then you'd have to save it before you got another picture. So normally, the thing you're trying to take a picture of had long gone, uh, just sort of left. Um, if you're taking, doing a portrait, the person would get fed up with you. Cameras had this great invention. They're called a shutter button. It took a long time for shutter buttons to make it to cell phones. And there are many similar things on the cell phone which should be migrated out of this sort of morass of menus. But because it's so easy to make menus, people just keep putting new features in. You're under a deadline. You just put it someplace. And you don't think about the overall cohesive experience. Some other th simple things that aren't. Um, again, not to point fingers at anything, Google Calendar. Um, there's this, you guys have a great feature, which is that quick ad. I think 30 Boxes also has it, where you type what you want to add to your calendar, and it goes. Really great, because you don't have to think about the mental model that the programmer had. But after you've done that quick ad, 
you can't access it in that way anymore. That information that you inputted goes into this form that looks much like everything else. And editing that is actually pretty annoying. If you watch people try to use it, they get sort of confused, they click around. Um, it's not at all as sort of transparent as just entering a sentence. Um, and generally, when you find yourself putting things into forms, you're, you're putting things into ways that are easy for the computer to understand, really easy to make, but not necessarily the best for humans. Um, so there's this, a great paper by uh, Brett Victor, which I recommend people read. But he went through the um, exercise of redesigning the BART Quick Planner. And this is what it looked like before, where you'd choose from, to, the date you're leaving, you hit submit. If you didn't know where you're going to or from, you'd click the view system app, bring you to an extra page, bring you back. It's sort of like the standard HTML model for doing these things. Really easy to program, but not so nice to actually use. Um, and he said, well, what information do you really need? Well, you need to know when your train is coming. So you have these. You, um, this is the present, this is the past, and you can't really see it, but it's grayed out. So you can, with a very quick glance, tell when your train is coming. And this map was even nicer. It actually zooms. So as you drag the to and the from around, it'll zoom out if you're getting near the edge, zoom in. So you only see the, the uh, minimum amount of information that you need. And it just it works wonderfully. There's none of this like choosing from to, is this where I wanted to go to? It just works. Um, I mean, this takes a lot of design inspiration from, from Tufty because there's a huge amount of density of information here. And if you were to go back and look at old books or whatnot, you'd find a uh, presentation of information that looked a lot more like this. So why do we constantly get interfaces that look that or that look like uh, Google Calendar? It's because it's so easy to make. And it's a trap that we shouldn't fall into. Just because it's easy doesn't actually mean that it's usable. So don't, don't stop thinking. Other simple things that aren't. So Google, again, has a wonderful spell check in their Google, Google talk, or in their, in their Google Mail, Gmail. But you don't have a spell check in the subject line. So you have to copy it from there into the main body and back again or move it someplace. Now, it's, it's not. It's, it's a burden to be, have to program that everywhere you want to use it. So it, programmers often abstract away, and you'll have some sort of class, and you can apply it to that area if you guys saw the need. But that's not really an extensible system. That means you have to think every time you want a text box where somebody could possibly want to spell check, you need to put it there. A programmer has to put it there. Shouldn't there be another way, a way which we can sort of somehow, and I'll be presenting this in a bit, somehow take functionality and move it outside the realm of one particular place where the programmer says it has to be here, and somehow move it to more globally so that if you need to spell check some text, it's the text you're spell checking and not the text field. And finally, another simple thing that isn't is just any slightly complex task or, or involved task. In this case, I'm choosing making a web page. Um, to actually do it, you need to have proficiency in an HTML editor, an image editor, a browser, FTP for uploading, possibly a shell, depending. So when you stop to think, as a beginner, what you had to learn to tackle the process of just making a simple home page for yourself, there is a lot there. Now there, are, you know, I think Google has some, and there are a lot of other people that try to make this process simpler. Um, but never taking a unified approach. They're always trying to solve that one problem, making all those pieces come together. Um, but this problem is universal on computers, that you are always having to move information from one application to another to get the functionality that you need. It's just like taking that text in the Google spell check, or in the um, Gmail, and having to move it around to be able to get that spell check functionality. So it's quite complex, actually. And when you have to teach somebody for the first time, this is why it's so daunting. So why, where does this problem lie? I think it lies at the very fundamental, very fundamental building box of the way we've been using computers up until now. And that is applications. 
you can imagine applications to be like walled cities. Um, each one has its own infrastructure. Each one has its own uh, idiosyncrasies and customs. And whenever you want to do something that uh, can only be done in one city and not the other, you have to go move over there to the other one. And now all those customs um, and new infrastructure really confuse you because it all works just slightly differently. So that's, that's sort of the mental model for, for applications. And what you end up are getting things like this. You have Word, Photoshop, and Mathematic on your system, say. In Word, you can't remove red eye in an image, but you might want to. So you have to copy it someplace else. Do that, move it back. Now you're in Photoshop. You're adding text to, so you're captioning something. You want to spell check it. No, can't do it there. You have to bring it over to Word or someplace else, spell check it, bring it back. You're in either one of those two applications, and you want to run up your grocery bill. You can't do that calculation there, because they're not equipped to do it. You have to copy it to Excel or the Python prompt or to Mathematica to do it. Something's wrong here. You should just have, whenever you have content, you should be able to act on it. So what happens? Well, in Word, that means is, is Microsoft wants to get more and more of that end tail, that long tail, to get all of its uh, users' wishes. The program has to grow and grow and grow until it becomes this giant portmanteau of all possible features. And of course, that's not their core competency. So the things that are out on the fringe are going to be implemented poorly and be hard to use. And Photoshop, similarly, has to grow and grow and grow. It has to include a text editor because you need to add captions. So it should include a spell check, and it should include all those different pagination bits. So it has to grow and grow and grow. And same thing with Mathematica. It also includes a spell check. Actually, I went recently and counted the number of spell checks on my computer, and it was eight. Different implementations with different interfaces and eight different copies of the English language. And a number of them know my name, but I think half of them still don't. So Mac does a pretty good job, right? They include a universal spell check and a universal dictionary. And that's a great start, but it's only a start. So it's, it's bad from a uh, user standpoint because they have to learn all of these different things. Um, and they have to relearn them. And a lot of the agitation and the, uh, like the, the hesitancy to learn a new application or to learn to do one new thing is not having to learn that one new thing. It's having to learn that entire range, that entire new gestalt for doing things in that new application. So you get a lot of waste. And that's why our computers are becoming bloated, or have become bloated. So it's not Microsoft's fault that everything has become monolithic. It's because of this need for people to have functionality without having to move around. That's why these applications keep growing larger and larger and larger, and why we build shovels that look like that. Right? So this is, this is the equivalence. Do you prepare dinner and assemble your furniture with a Swiss Army knife? No, you want to use tools that are specific to its need. But we end up building monolithic applications because you sort of want this Swiss Army knife. right? You want to have all that functionality at your fingertips, but there's no way to do it in an application-centric model. All right, so what's the solution? And since I'm talking at Google, how does it apply to the net? First, I think that language has a lot of untapped power. Um, we saw the start of this revolution on the web with searching, and it got brought back to the desktop, where you now type what you want to find. And that's, that's great. Um, it's really helped sort of ease the pains of the bloated file systems that we use with these hierarchies, which I'll come back to why hierarchies are bad in a bit. So semantic length, you know the game Pictionary? It's this game where you have a little card and you get these either concrete or abstract idea, and you have to draw it and get somebody else to guess it. It's a fun party game. But there's no reverse game, right? There can't be a reverse game, because once you have the word, it's done. So language has a lot of power. And the GUI, or the, sorry, the command line used to be sort of the de jure, right? And people have moved away from it in some ways, or at least the mass 
area of computing has moved away from it because it's somehow scary. Um, but I'd argue that that's not because there's something terribly difficult inherently with command line interfaces, but rather that there's something inherently difficult with the names they chose for their commands and their particular syntax. I mean, for me, trying to remember what command line options come after tar to make it unpack a gzip is something like, I don't know, mm, trying to bob for apples in a cement mixer, right? It's uh, not a pleasant experience. So why can't you use language to bring the functionality you need to you? So if I wanted to spell check this, why can't I just type spell check? And have it bring up a spell check and then come up here. Right? Why can't I do that? Why can't I, if I have a calculation, wherever I am, just type calculate? Ah, there we go. That, by the way, was my favorite approximation for pi, if anybody caught it go by. Um, so I think this is, I'll, I'll show you exactly what I was doing in a little bit. Um, but I think this is the power of language, that instead of having lots of little icons all over the place to do one for every possible thing you could ever think of, which clearly won't scale, you have to start harnessing the power of language. So the first and simple solution, um, before we get more complex, is the idea of getting to content on your computer. Um, before we, tr we try to solve the problem of bringing functionality to you. So command line interfaces are great for getting to content, because you type a couple keystrokes and you're there. Um, I don't think I need to convince anybody of that. But it's interesting that there is actually a command line interface that almost everybody uses, or anybody that uses the web, and that's the URL bar. If you think about it, you used to type in, um, in Unix, RC to go to your news. You type Pine to go to read your mail. Well, now you type nytimes.com to see your news, and you type Gmail to see your mail. It's the same thing. People are getting used to the idea that you type to go where you want to go. Now imagine if you had to pull down out of a list one out of the possible, I don't know, 100 million websites that exist, right? Ludicrous. It would take forever. Um, that's why the bookmarks bar is, is or the menu is, is so bad, because you soon get too many. You start having to do hierarchies, and it's just it's not a good solution. You'd much rather have something like Delicious, um, where you could, or even just Google, where you can actually find things really fast anyway. So typing gives you a lot of power. Um, so a lot of, so command line interfaces, I really think, are on a way to a comeback uh, with search. And I think it's going to go further and further. That thing in Gmail, or in, uh, in, in Google Calendar, where you do a quick ad, that's a command line, if restricted. Okay. Other ways of getting to content, Spotlight, Google Desktop Search, or whatever that thing is in uh, Vista. And a little plug, the humanized Ensel launcher is another way of getting to where you want to go. You type where you want to go. Um, so for instance, um, if I wanted to open up Notepad, you could simply type open Notepad. And Notepad's open. If I wanted to open up a calculator, I could type open calculator. If I wanted to go over, I, I have down here a whole bunch of tabs. Uh, one's open to the Long Now Foundation. If I wanted to go over there, I could type go Long Now Foundation. If I wanted to switch tabs, I can simply type go slash dot, which is over on the left. I'm over there. Right? This is the power of using language to move around your system. Because you, all you have to do is think where you want to go, and you're there. Um, so you know, GDS does a little bit of this. It doesn't do moving and manipulating windows. Um, but it certainly gets you to the application or the file you're looking for, which is, which is as I said, a really great start. Um, by the way, what I'm doing is I'm holding down caps lock, and while I'm holding it down, I type. So I just caps lock, and then go. I want to go to the New York Times, so I start typing Times, and it brings me there. 
Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a powerful idea. Um, one of the nice things is that using systems like this lets you uh, integrate your idea of bookmarks and folders and files. So I don't think I've learned slash dot. I haven't. So I can say go over here to slash dot and then teach Enso something. Learn as open slash dot. Open slash dot is now a command. So if I close this and I say open slash dot, it brings me there. But why stop there? Well, um, let me hide all these things. Here is a, um, an image that I have on my desktop. And if I wanted to always open that, I could say learn as open and then uh, Google image, just thing. It's now a command. So no matter where I am, I can type open Google image and opens it up. Right, so all of a sudden, accessing, in the same way that, that search lets you access any type of um, information just by typing in one place and going there, things like this let you access any type of information on your computer all in one sort of unified way. And it wouldn't be possible if you restricted yourself to purely visual means because you just, it, it doesn't have the same sort of power that language does. So let's go back to here. Um, often one of the ways I start this uh, presentation is by actually force quitting the desktop um, and then using Enso to get around. But I didn't do it this time. OK, so that's part of the solution. That's sort of the simple bit of the solution. The next part is that you need to bring functionality to people. You need to get that spell check somehow to wherever the content is that people are, or the people are manipulating. And I think there are two big points to this, two sort of halves. One is the idea that's really taken off with mashups and whatnot on the web, the idea of services. When you come up with a piece of functionality, you need to be able to publish that so other people can take advantage of that functionality. Applications are like walled cities, right? So they hoard their functionality. But you need to give it away so that other people can use it wherever they are. Well, you maybe charge for it too. But the other bit is you need a universal access interface. So you have services, right? You have this huge range of things you can possibly do. You have you know, a map. You have um, searching. You have calculating. You have doing integrals, uh, rendering to law tech, the full range of things on your computer that you can possibly do now accessible to you anywhere. Well, how do you make it accessible anywhere? Right? That's where the power of language comes in. So you need a universal access interface. So services, quickly, let you, you know, stand on the shoulder of giants, give you mashups. Interestingly enough, I think this is the first interesting point here, is that they give you a separation of the UI from the back end. So this makes it really easy for other people to say, aha, these people have a great map, but um, the front end sucks. So I'm going to steal it and make it better. And you get this wonderful symbiosis where the marketplace can flourish because everybody can sort of stand on the shoulders of people who've gone before to make the product which is best. Um, and of course, and everybody down at the bottom of the pile can still make a lot of money because everybody's using their, their back end. And so the point I want to make is that these services up until now have really been for sort of the developers, right? Google makes a whole bunch of these APIs available for free, but it's not usable so much by the end user as by the developer making something for the end user. I think we need to go that next step and make them somehow available for the end user. So access. Um, let me give you, before I go on, a, uh, a simple demonstration. Well, I'll read this first. Um, the more applications I try to, I found this on Slashdot. The more applications I try forcing into a tabbed web MDI model under a Mac, the more clumsy it gets. They aren't in my dock. They can't be Apple tabbed through. Issues like this really frustrate myself as I find myself wanting to use more Web 2.0 Ajaxy fancy pants programs. It's a problem that Google is certainly having. You have those list of, uh, of possible applications along the top of your uh, account. But that's not really a scalable solution. This is starting to look more and more like separate applications on your computer when you really want to have all that functionality available to you at any time. For instance, 
going to open Dojo Rich Text Editor, which I think you uh, spent a lot of time working on, actually. Um, and I'll just point out that this is on somebody else's server, so this is sort of a no tricks up my sleeve um, moment. It's just a standard HTML-based rich text editor, um, which you can type in. Well, say this was Gmail. And say you're sending an email to your friend, and you wanted to tell them to come to your office in Chicago. And you wanted to add a map. Right now, there's no really good way of doing that. You'd have to take a picture and upload it. Google can certainly implement something, but that takes a lot of burden on Google to think of all the possible things they'd want to do. Why can't you do things like, say, um, let me find my cursor. Hello. There we go. Why can't you do things like, here is a map of Chicago. And then say, add map. Right? Why can't you do things like that? Why can't you do things like, say, here is an aerial, uh, plus or minus spelling, photo of Boston? Um, thank you. Um, well, I guess that's an aerial photo of Boston. Um, there we go. So why can't you do these things? Well, the reason why they haven't been done already is simply because there are too many possible things you could possibly want to do to make it feasible to add them to your interface without making them really cluttered and hard to, to confront or start to, to start using. But if you harness the power of language, then you start enabling all of these features, all of these ways of calling in other people's applications into your application without you even having to implement them, which is pretty cool, actually. Um, this functionality is entirely there despite the fact that the people who developed this didn't think that they wanted this functionality or think to implement it. So this is the power of combining services with a universal access interface where you can do things like this or um, calculate here or even, uh, let's see open up Excite. You guys have a great translation tool. It's awesome. The problem is that when I'm surfing some site, I don't want to have to think, oh, I want to go translate this now. If I'm there, I want to translate it right then. So why couldn't I just go from Japanese? Um, <laughs> absolutely clear. <laughs> All right, so this is what I mean by access. This is what I mean by not following the models that have gone before with the sort of application-centric viewpoint. So the current methods are not scalable, right? And I'm talking to you in particular bookmarklets because you know, if you start using them, they just end up cluttering and they're, they're too many. So you know, this sort of thing where you type works really well. That thing I was talking about before, and that has grown quite a bit since I last took a screenshot. Um, that's not scalable. The URL bar is limited. And so you need this fast semantic method. You need some way of taking all of these features and bringing them to you or to the user. And I've been showing off Enso. Um, there, there are a number of features that it actually has. Like you can, you can define words or spell check, open files, go here and go there. Um, we have two products, but it's the, the important thing, I think, really, is that it's a framework around which you start thinking of these sorts of ways of accessing information and modifying information. Of course, the cool thing is that once you do things like this, you stop needing um, new interfaces to navigate around. It becomes much simpler because if you wanted to go define a word now, you can, you know, it just works. Um, OK. So this marries the power of GUIs with command lines. And interestingly enough, now that this has been out in the real world for a little bit, this Enzo thing, um, we've gotten a lot of testimonials. And our goal was to make a program which would work 
just as well for beginners as it does for power users. And it seems to have achieved that. When I do tech support, and you know, it's, we're four people, and so we constantly rotate around so that only one person has to deal with the dumb users. Um, you know, we answer the phone, and I've answered the phone for a 70-year-old Southern man who is using our program. My favorite testimonial so far has been somebody who said, I, the geek, love it, but my wife, the technophobe, loves it even more. The point I'm trying to make here is that command lines aren't necessarily scary if you present them in a nice way. If you use sort of the newer thinking um, and newer interfaces to give people help as they try to use it. Uh, if you give them really good help systems. And because it also marries the command line interface with semantic language. So you no longer have to remember these archaic, very, uh, very short command lines and know that kill really sends a signal. So it's only kill minus 9 that actually kills. And kill minus 7 does, I don't know, just says hello to the next process. And then I think the most important part is that you take all of this power of being able to access your information or your content manipulation, and you marry that with the idea of services so that you don't, as one company, has to develop everything. You can open these things up and give anybody the option to develop a new front end. And in the end, with interfaces, I think it's important to keep in mind that content is everything. That's everything you do on the computer is either manipulating, creating, selecting, or navigating, or searching content. That's really it. Everything else, you're just fiddling with your computer. Everybody here knows Isaac Asimov's rules of robotics, right? Probably don't need to reiterate them, but robots shouldn't harm people. Robots shouldn't. Um, they should avoid, obey people, and a robot should protect its own existence. There's a corollary, actually, um, over in, in interface design, which, which Jeff started and then I added one, um, which is that an interface should not harm your content or through an action allow your content to come to harm, um, which seems simple enough, right? Seems like we do a pretty good job of that. But if you stop to think about it, we don't. Currently, when you're typing away on your, your you know, desktop application document or whatnot, it defaults to throwing away your work. You have to explicitly tell it to save. That's backwards. Google does a pretty good job, but not all the time. An interface shall not waste your time required to do more work than is strictly necessary. That's pretty good. But once again, computers do waste our time often. Um, they ask us unnecessary questions. Every time you get a dialog box that comes up and says, um, something's just happened, and you have to click OK, that's wasting your time. Because you have to do something when no input is required. An interface shall not allow itself to get into a state where it cannot manipulate content. There's a cute story where somebody thought they'd come up with an absolutely foolproof interface, um, which is silly because somebody will always invent a better fool. And in this case, Somebody very uh, intelligently became a fool. And anything in this interface could be customized, which meant that um, you could change the color of the text and the background, change them both to white, and it was unusable. Like The whole interface was just this white screen. Um, so you, but there are lots of other times that, uh, that an interface actually lets itself get into an unusable state. Um, so if interfaces followed all three of these things, we'd be doing really well. Um, so actually, I'm going to stop here for a second and see if there are any questions about what I was talking before about that universal access stuff. Anybody have any questions that sprung up or what it is that I'm typing on screen? No? You've introduced a new command language, and we'll assume you've done it perfectly, and it's the exact right one. But as soon as people decide they like it, uh, 15 other companies will be have competing languages for similar commands, and you'll be uh, you know, back to the, which is 
we'll be back to the command line, which the uh, Mac interface did away with originally, pretty much for that reason. Um, that's your reaction to that. It's a, it's a good question. So for all the people that couldn't hear, he's asking what happens when um, other companies jump in on something like this, and then you end up with an explosion of different, uh, different command names that all do the same thing. We actually already have the exact same problem, I'd argue, with applications. Right? You could have made the argument a while ago that um, every application was going to have a similar name for the ones that did photo manipulation. Um, and that you get this burgeoning, and you wouldn't know which one was which, and you get very confused. I would uh, guess that in the marketplace, it would very quickly become clear which ones were dominant, and people would use those. There'd be a big fish in a small pond. That's my guess. Um, the problem of finding the correct synonym for what you're looking for is, I think, a corollary. And I think what that requires is a really good method, as I said before, of help to find what you're looking for in the first place. And if you can't find it, of um, giving a suggestion, sort of the did you mean sort of thing, to get you to the right spot. Um, but I don't really know what will happen if, if I, well, I do know what happened. One would emerge, and that would be the one that everybody settled on. Any other questions? Let's pass that around. Hi, this, this is great stuff. So actually, um, I think about 10 years ago, maybe it was Brad Meyer's group at CMU, yeah. did something similar where they were talking about connecting, like sort of breaking down the walls between applications. And their major comment was that um, if we want to add more services and do more cool things, that we want to, uh, what's really hard is you don't, programmers aren't going to want to do any more than they have to. Mm. Like they don't usually develop APIs unless there's some impetus from outside to develop an API. So you know your services are going to, I mean, you can only do so much, right? You probably can't access everything in Word that you might want to do. I might want to do cool things from Photoshop that just aren't possible with your tool mm. because you don't, Photoshop doesn't have the APIs. I mean, what sort of, what do you think about, you know, getting more services and, and making, enabling more things, right, that are really service-based? Well, how is that going to happen? Well, the lovely thing is that right now it truly seems that people are thinking in a very service-oriented way. That's like the current buzzword. So that means you can leverage all this wonderful functionality that already exists around the net. Um, realistically, I think you have to get to a certain size um, of commercial success before people are going to start wanting to write for your tool. Um, and I think that's if we ever want to see a system like this truly take off, you need to make it large enough that people start developing in such a way. Say, for instance, that you went to Adobe. You're like, if you add this to your system, not only does your system become faster, but now since you just bought Macromedia, you can now integrate across every one of your applications at once um, and reduce training time. Because once you know one, you know all the others, even though the underlying interface hasn't changed that much. I think things like that, where you get this idea into the consciousness and make people really want to develop for this, is the way to, to make it. Because programmers are. Um, I mean, a little bit megalomaniacal, right? They, they like seeing their stuff work uh, out there, used. So that's, I think, the real pull of, a, of services, right? Because if you um, put out your service and then another 100 people develop something on top of your work, your work is still getting used. So I don't know. Those are sort of like a birdshot approach to answering your question. Uh, very cool UI, by the way. I liked it. Uh, it strikes me that what you've created is kind of a search engine for services. They're, they, may, they happen to be local services on my computer, but mm. it, it's, and it's very search engine-y. Like I want, it to, I want it to find whatever it is that I meant, whether right. I've tagged it before or not. So power came to web search engines when they stopped doing hand-called directories and started doing automated processes for extracting the meaning of web pages that could <clears throat> could scale better. Have you thought about how to automate this so that, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it, it goes and finds the service that I mean, rather than me having to tag it or somebody else having had ta have um, to tag it? So another way of saying that, I guess, is that 
with web searches, you type what you want to find. With this, you type what you want to do. How do you make typing what you want to do as semantic as possible so that you can type whatever it is that you want and it happens? Or if it doesn't know how to do it, it finds it. And, and you can leverage the fact that there are 20 other people typing what I want to do and, and that they, if they don't find what they, what they wanted, they actually perform the action. So it seems like there's a machine learning, you know, in, the, in an abstract sense, there, there's a machine learning problem there or something that you There do. certainly does. I haven't done much thinking towards that end since um, we're still on the one computer, one person sort of model. But I, I fully agree that using that sort of power to figure out what people do is, would be great. Um, this is more an observation. But actually, um, within Google Search and within the search box already, there's already a lot of that sort of command line right. interface. Right. And this is what I want to do. Like, you type a, an expression, and it will calculate it for you. You say, convert money to money, and it will do that. And there's quite a lot of those. And I think already some of our users are starting to experience problems yeah. with that because they forget the exact syntax. Like, if you want to convert money to money, you have to say convert. I can't remember what the, the keyword is. If you try it in German or French, it hasn't been internationalized properly or at all. But, but nevertheless, that model is starting to, to come through in, in Google search. So it's more like Google do this, right. one of which things is search. So I think it's kind of interesting that uh, we, we, Google, are kind of getting there already. Uh, the thing is, you seem to have it all over your applications, that possibility. But I just thought I'd point that out. No, exactly. I mean, um, we were really pleased to see when Google started doing that because I mean, that's, once you start typing, you just you start wanting to have that functionality there. Your feedback's very good, by the way, yeah. in that regard. The fact that Well, it's 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 necessary. Otherwise, people have trouble remembering where they're trying to go or what they're trying to do. Um, which is why all those autocompletes on the web. That's like a new innovation in computing, which is a little bit silly since we've had autocomplete for a very long time. Um, and in particular, right now, we try to help that problem of uh, having too many syntaxes, one by doing it this way, but also by always having a um, like noun verb sort of thing. You always select some content and use a verb on it. Um, so you'd select something and then say convert to, uh, which is a little bit easier than the problem of typing the whole thing out and then hitting go at the end, because you get some of that, that feedback. Um, any other questions or okay? You might want to uh So I had a related question regarding how do people know what features exist on their machine? So you know with a UI at least you can put it up. So you right. can make them focus on these are the features that and that exist and people can see it and realize that that exists. If it's all command line based, how will they ever find out what 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 are all the features on there? Machine. So I'm going to address that problem. Turn that around just a little bit and say, when you want to find a new feature in Photoshop, how do you find it? Generally, it's by wading through a huge mess of menus, right? And it takes a long time. And even if you already knew it existed, it takes a long time. Um, so the problem then is one of visibility. The way I'd argue people would use this system, wouldn't it be great when you're using Photoshop? Instead of buying that whole massive thing, you know you just want to do some simple editing of photographs. You want to change histogram and whatnot. Wouldn't it be awesome if you could just download those features, just pay for those? So in the same way, it would be great with Enso and the way we're, we're sort of doing our business model and, and approach is that instead of giving people this monolithic thing, people go, I want to do this. They go download a package or find a package which does that, and then they learn that. So it's a very linear learning curve. You only have to learn one thing at a time. And that's the answer, is that I don't think you'd ever be confronted um, just with learn everything at once. Because even in Unix, that's not what you do. You start by learning one thing, and then you need to do something new, and you learn that one thing. Um, and if you make it all very consistent, that linear learning step is very small. So you go get a package, you learn that package, and you're done. Plus, as I said before, you need a really good help system, or you could start leveraging the power of multiple people using it to figure out what people actually want to do. So that's how you do it. Um, and to point out, we aren't, a lot of people accuse us of uh, hating the mouse. We don't. Um, it's just you wouldn't want to 
write a novel with your mouse in the same way you wouldn't want to paint a picture using only the keyboard. Um, there are tasks that are suited to one another. So we're certainly exploring how to use the mouse and, and get, a little, get these affordances to be a little bit more visual. But for now, this is, this is enough. And people seem to be able to use it. I regret to say at the moment it's tied. Um, our goal is to port it. Um, one of the coolest things, as a little anecdote, is that one of our developers develops this thing on a Mac, but in a virtual machine. Um, and when I went to use his computer, it always messes me up just moving between Mac and Windows because my pinky doesn't know where to hit the right control key anymore, just for doing copy and paste. Well, when Enso was involved, it was always with the caps lock. So I was able to use it identically on both systems, even though the hardware was slightly different. Um, and our goal is to eventually port this to Mac and to Linux, and then you write a program or a service for Enso, and then it's immediately ported to all three. Um, so the Enzo launcher is, seems in many ways a spiritual successor to Canon Cat and whatever was the thing that came before it, mm. Apple to extension. Yeah. And that was 20, 25 years ago. I was wondering what you think are still the main sort of challenges for things like Enzo and Quicksilver to become really mainstream and what are you planning to do about that to overcome these challenges? Well, I mean, the first thing is that you have to convince, like, Enzo and Quicksilver are both absolutely great. And I think the guy who develops Quicksilver is sitting right there. Um, but they're, both of them are still add-ons. You know, To make it truly universal, it needs to get included into an operating system. Um, or conversely, if you're just going to do it for the browser, it needs to get, um, go upstream so that it's just always available. Um, Really, I think that's mainly it. You just have to get people to change, start having services. Um, and once, I mean, essentially, the Mac OS, OS X service uh, menu uh, or text extension is sort of like what both of these things do, right? Well, it's sort of like what Enso does, but it doesn't have a good interface. So if you married that to Spotlight, you'd have something much closer. So I think things are sort of, you can sort of imagine people feeling around in the dark and every once in a while going a step forward but they don't know where they're going. And I think this is where people should be, should be heading. So that's what I think it needs to take to get this really out there. So the question is, uh, can you bring in sort of machine learning to make the computer clever enough to guess what the user is trying to do? I won't say authoritatively no, but I'm always very wary of the computer suggesting, going far out suggesting, because oftentimes when the computer is clever, it's actually really dumb, just like Clippy is. Um, so it's a very fine line to walk. And I'd rather err at the moment on you explicitly telling the computer what to do if that's really easy, than having it guess and you have to tell it, no, that's not what I want. Um, but I think there's a lot of machine learning that can be done. Like back in that BART example, uh, the author had done some work so that depending on the time of day and what day it was, it'd show you different schedules based on what it had learned. And that worked great. So yes, I think there is a symbiosis that can be had but I am very hesitant to go too far in that direction um, because otherwise you'll end up with things like Microsoft's adaptive menus, which were always running away from you. So it appears that I've gone for an hour, which is too bad since this is only half of the talk. <laughs> um, what is the sense in terms of people's schedules of whether I should quickly go on to the next cool thing, or whether you want to stay here. What, I don't know how long you can sit in these chairs for. Anybody want to help me? I think it's um, up to what you want to do. We could, obviously, no one's uh, forced to stay here. So if you want to All go right. on for a little bit, we can. Well, if you like the sound of my voice that much. Um, 
So I guess I'll move on to the other side of where I think interfaces need to go. Um, and I'll, I'll try to move a little bit more quickly than I was before. Um, but the point is, again, the content is key. And if you stop to try to break down an interface, I think you can break it down in, always into four things. Creating content, navigating content, selecting content, and transforming it. And so I was showing you with Enso that I would first select something, always, and then I'd run a command, and that transformed it in some way. Um, or I would not select something and transform the system state and, and navigate, essentially. So the, the, the name of this talk is sort of away with applications, the death of the desktop. What dooms the desktop in the traditional sense? Well, it's because if you think about it, it's not about content, right? What work do you get done here? None. This is all the time that you spend, any, rather, all the time you spend here is time spent getting the right application open or the right web page open to actually do your work. Um, so that's why I think this concept of the desktop is, should be out. But I'm not being exactly fair. The desktop does do something. What does it do? It lets you get your computer into a state where you can enter content, as I said. So with things like Google Desktop Search and with Enso or Quicksilver, I think that problem is solved. Getting there fast is more or less we've seen the solution. But it does two other things. It lets you categorize content and lets you navigate content. And those are things which Enso doesn't help as much with. Um, you can certainly tag or do other things, and it, Enso gives you a way of, of actually performing those tasks, but it doesn't give you sort of an, of an overall view. So what is the solution for those two things? Well, there are better ways, faster ways. And actually, the web, I think, is doing a really good job of leading the way. Um, in particular, in categorization, we've learned two things. One, that tags work really well. If you have a picture of uh, your Uncle Bob at the 4th of July party, you should be able to put it in both areas. You shouldn't have to put it in a folder for one or the other. Does that make sense? And the other idea is that search actually helps you get rid of the need to categorize. If you have a really good search, then you don't need to spend the time to categorize your data as well. So I think these two things combined sort of go to form the death of the forced hierarchy that we see all the time with our file systems on the computer. Um, OK, navigation. I'll go quickly through here as well. So I think when you're coming up to come up with a replacement for the desktop, you need to let content be content. People are in the HCI world are really fond of saying that things are, have direct manipulation. Um, that when you're moving a file around, you're moving a text file around. But that's not quite right. You're actually moving an icon that represents the file around. So it's not quite as good. We should let content be itself. The best file name for a file is not something short that tries to summarize you know, a 20-page document. It should be the document itself. You should let search be search. Don't categorize when you don't need to. Let 2D content be 2D content. This one's important. People are really bad at navigating 3D. First-person shooters are hard. Walking through a maze is hard. Looking at it from the top is much easier. Our current system, where we have windows that hide behind other windows, they're actually in 3D, well, 2.5D. And people have a lot of problems navigating through here. A lot of the time you waste on the computer. If you get a computer, a new computer screen, rather, that's much larger than your previous one, your productivity goes up between you know, 5 to, to 20%. I think Jakob Nielsen says 10 to 15. Why? Part of that's because um, you, just, you can make your windows larger in general and see more. But all of it's because you're doing a lot less manipulation of your windows. Windows aren't getting hidden, so you don't have to take that mental step to figure out where it was and reacclimate yourself. It becomes true that where things are on your screen is what they are. And finally, don't let the don't do anything to the user structure. Don't force any uh, mental model on them. Just like when you're doing the quick ad, you're not forcing a mental model because the user can just type what they're thinking. Um, there's no translation process. You shouldn't have to force people to do the same thing with folders on their computer. So I'm going to ignore this thing. The important thing is I think we should take advantage of people's 
mental model, their ability to have really good 2D spatial awareness and use the where it is is what it is. Um, and use the idea of zoom. Um, so by the way, this for the, the uh, visual or the, the camera people is where it needs to switch over to video. Um, whatever, they told me to say that. <laughs> um, all right, so here, here's the basic idea. You have two controls, zoom in, zoom out, and three controls, pointing, and an almost fanatical devotion to the Pope. Um, so it gives you the instructions here. Um, just click and point. So I'm going to click here. It says the full in introduction is here. So I zoom in. And hey, look. I can now read all about the whole thing. Uh, it talks about direct manipulation. talks about what to look for. Zoom out again. Want to go take a look at uh, my pictures of San Francisco? OK, well, let's take a look. There's, there's a nice market picture. Uh, we'll go over to San Francisco. Here's a nice map. I'll zoom in, come down, look. Ah, oh, I've embedded my pictures exactly where they were. You have multiple views on things. Um, the point is that content is always, always represents itself. Um, and it's always immediate where you came from and where you're going to. There's no force hierarchy. You can lay everything out exactly as you will. And the amazing thing is that you always know where things are in relation to each other. You always know that your pictures are up someplace to the left and that the documents are some over, over to the right. And people turn out to be really good at this. Um, Jeff worked for a company called Apricus for a little bit to help them try to figure out how to do, for nurses, their medical charts. Um, and it, there was a simple problem. You had the medical chart, which the nurse would write on. And they wanted to put that on the computer so they didn't have to transfer that at some point. Um, and it used to be sort of looked like Excel with lots of tabs along the top and the bottom. And it looked exactly like a computer program. It took nurses three days to learn how to use in intensive seminars. He went to something like this, where it was literally just the medical chart they were used to seeing, but you could zoom in, zoom out. When you got close enough, you could start editing. It took nurses, went from three days to 45 seconds. And they're fully proficient. And it was just as fast. The funny thing is that the nurses that, um, that were already trained in computers and were really savvy, it took them a minute and 20 seconds to learn how to use it well, because they had to forget something first um, and unlearn their previous knowledge. So it actually works really well. And then they realized, hey, you don't have to stop just at, um, at the medical charts. What happens if you zoom out from there? Why can't you see the medical charts for everybody in that room? Zoom out, everybody in that ward. Zoom out, everybody on that floor. Zoom out. Everybody in the hospital, zoom out your chain of hospitals, right? All of a sudden, you have a very easy uh, metaphor to help people navigate around. Um, mind you, this is only navigation and not search. Uh, because you need search, too, because navigation is always slow. Um, so one of the really nice things, actually, about the zooming metaphor is that it scales very, very well, uh, let me make my window smaller, to screen size. So let me make this the size of a cell phone, um, sort of like your, your Google Maps stuff. When you have this really tight feedback loop in Zoom, all of a sudden, this entire world is not just as usable, but almost as good. It takes a little bit longer to go read things. But it works on any size of display. And the map, this sort of visual data, works really well. You zoom out. Zoom in. Again, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but it's still uh, zooming is, is very, very nice. And as the press is often uh, fond of saying, that that's one of the best things about uh, Google Earth, although the zoom there is still a little bit funky. So you can start doing lots of other cool things, like um, say you're, you're coming into this picture of the Golden Gate Bridge. Well, I have a whole bunch of things that are related to that picture. Here's an essay that I wrote about the Golden Gate Bridge in Japanese. Um, I really hope nobody here speaks Japanese, because I wrote this a long time ago, and the grammar is awful. Um, it was about my, my favorite building. And 
here are a whole bunch of words that I used in that uh, essay. Why couldn't I just have that application sitting there go in and I could use it? Right? There's no good reason. You can now just start having anything that's related anywhere you want it. Um, so there, there's a lot in this demo. Um, and you can look around. One of my, my favorite things is, is this, which is a review of Jeff's book, um, a little bit about it. But what is the definition of a maze? A maze is a series of interconnected rooms connected by doors where you're in one room, you can see the exits, but you can't see what's in the next room. Once you go through that door, you're in your next room, and you can't see where you came from. What is the web? The web is a series of pages with links. And once you click on a link, you can't see where you came from. And before you click on, you couldn't see where you're going. There's something similar. Wouldn't it be great if you could sort of fly over the whole thing, just like you would to solve a normal maze, uh, and look at it from the top down? So why have a link when you could just actually have the page? Let content be content. So here's the review. And you'd be there. Or uh, if you're trying to actually integrate this, you could come in here, and there'd be there'd be Amazon. So integrating this with the current web is uh, something of a nightmare. But it's definitely a direction that I want to get people thinking in. Um, so actually, let me let me show you something else, which is uh, which is sort of fun. Let me see if I actually have it up. I don't think so. And we'll drag this over here. So remember before when I was talking about uh, when I was talking about oops, there we go. Um, the problem of doing HTML editors, right? and that you had to go all these different places just to make one simple web page. Well, imagine if you're trying to solve it in sort of a pragmatic way, um, where you say, I'm not going to reinvent Adobe Photoshop for now. I just want a product where I can make all these things work a lot better together. Um, well, you can use the zooming metaphor there, too. So here we are. We're starting. This is just some JavaScript code. Um, I could edit this. Then I could zoom out. I could zoom out. There we go. Um, and you have all the things that are related to the global section of the humanized site. It has, here was the JavaScript. This is, uh, this is the CSS. Zoom out. Um, here are the images. You can pan around. And so you can just do the manipulations right in place. Were this a uh, fully functioning, um, instead of just a demo, then you could just use Enso to you know, zoom in to this thing and say, select it, and say, you know, flip, horizontal. And it would flip it. You could, you could start doing all of your manipulations in place. So this is, this is good. And then you could, you could zoom out again. And you could say, oh, yeah, there are all of my um, files and folders that I'm currently working on in the main section. And down here, I am. Um, have all the communications that I'm, I'm currently working on with when talking to other people. So all of a sudden, it becomes really easy to keep track of all of those things that you are doing because you're taking advantage of people's spatial mapping. Where it is is what it is. Things never get lost. Um, but the reason, real reason why I bring this example up is because I wanted to show you that navigation, as I said before, is slow. You need something else there. You need a search. You need some way to go where you're going fast. Um, those are the two parts. So you need to be able to say, well, I know that I want to go up here to my CSS thing. So I do a find for CSS. It finds it. And it zooms in. Um, then I want to go over to the JavaScript. So I type JavaScript. And it brings me there. I wanted to go down to I have a chat with Andrew. So I type Andrew really fast. And were this not written in JavaScript, it would go much faster. And it just brings me there. Um, right? So you need those two things. You need that ability to get where you're going really fast. And you need that ability to always have a really nice mental model, sort of this, this zooming area 
where you can see everything that you're working on. Um, and of course, you know, you can, you can name these things like monkey. And then when you're you're moving around, you can also go to certain areas instead of just one area, um, or instead of one window. So this is the sort of way that I see the desktop going. Um, that you'd come up to your computer originally, and it would have this sort of blank canvas where you could start putting content. And once the content was there, you could start manipulating it using any of those services. And this is sort of like my end goal for where I think computers should be going. Um, so we have a unique opportunity to break away from the desktop metaphor, especially now with the web, um, bringing some of these ideas of universal access and different ways of presenting information. I think we have, we have a great opportunity. We need to always be thinking about designing the big picture. Otherwise, you're going to end up with all those separate applications that go across the top of the Google homepage. And they're going to fall, befall the exact same fate that befell all of their typical applications. They're going to grow and grow and grow and start looking more and more and more like their original inspirations. Or I should probably not say inspirations, but the original, like, you, they're going to start looking like Microsoft's products. They're going to start looking like um, Adobe's products because you're going to want to pander to more and more people's needs, and they're going to keep growing to meet them, and they're going to become monolithic. So you need to think about the, start thinking about the big picture now. And I've given you my solutions, or some of them, but I challenge you to think of other solutions, and there are others. Um, you know, Enso is mine, Quicksilver's is his, and there are lots of others out there. Um, so I really challenge you to do that. So the take-home message is to think about content, harness the power of language, really use services, even in your own applications, to bring unification. And that's it. And as my shameless plug, I'll put that up there. Um, any questions now that I've gone even more over time? I noticed in a number of your examples, you had a very short a sequence of commands that you could enter to get to whatever it was you were doing. I think at some point, uh, the realm of possibility of computing um, leads to some very complex, big language. Do you anticipate disambiguation as a solution or very complex commands to reach places, which seems to be what, uh, what makes the command line uh, in a shell relatively mm. uh, powerful but difficult? Well, I think. The command line sort of started off on the wrong foot, and people continued on with, by naming things to be as short as possible without semantic things. Because we're, we can talk um, and name any one of these huge number of things we can possibly do. Making it always short is, as you say, is going to be difficult. So um, disambiguation will be a part of it. Um, but you don't want to ever get in the case where it says, you mean one of these five things every time you do it. Right. In the same vein, I see um, if there is a marketplace and mm -hmm. a bunch of competitors are offering similar services, how do you negotiate that on the desktop and also compensate for the fact that sometimes I want services offered by different parties? I don't want to uh, select and lock in. Well, so instead, so, so one, I think verbs are going to be the big thing. So you essentially, when you go to make something, you think about what verbs, what actions you want to do. Um, and so this, you know, Enso isn't a full language, like natural language processor. So that really does restrict and make it much easier to um, make your commands really short because at every step of the way, it's sort of helping you along um, and makes our problem much more tractable. My imagining for how this would work in the marketplace is that companies, just like they're making Photoshop now or Mathematica, are going to come in and say, I'm making this product. They're going to give their set of verbs. And those, indeed, might conflict with other people's sets of verbs. Um, but you're probably only going to have one of those on your system at the same time. Or uh, you'll have to have disambiguation systems where it's prepended or appended by the company's names. 
in the exact same way that when you're going through the start menu now, you can have five things named paint. Do you imagine the, um, uh, the suggest features that you have today possibly being contextualized? Probably, yeah. Okay. I mean, it's in the suggest features that um, when they're not forcing the user into doing something, that a lot of, I think, machine learning can come in really handy so that if you don't get it the first time, the computer knows what you want the second time. Uh, so, so you've thought a lot about the desktop interface, but if you look at most of the world now, especially uh, the developing world uh, and a lot of Asia, it's not on desktops. Mm. It can be on mobile phones. Yeah. And um, I mean, speech interfaces are one uh, discussion of where to go. But so, do you have any thoughts, or like, do you have a, a little compact vision of what you think mobile phones might uh, might be the right thing to do there? So the main problem with mobile phones is the small screen size. Um, voice is fine for input, but horrible for output because with our eyes we can sort of track around the random access. Ears are not active; they're not random access. Um, so I don't think, as output, audio is ever going to replace um, the visual media. Otherwise, we're going to end up with voicemail systems. My guess um, is that for, for cell phones, as they want to access more and more data, um, you're going to need some sort of metaphor like zooming so that you can go in easily and out easily with some sort of really good search. They're the same problem on the desktop as, as finding your data and looking at it, um, just slightly modified for the small screen. But I don't know, it's, it's an interesting and hard problem. Um, actually, I think gaze tracking is going to be one of the big innovations at some point. Um, just because it's so small, pointing is really hard, that once pointing becomes really easy, pointing and typing become easy, then a lot of our problems are going to be solved in, when, even though you're working on a uh, cell phone. Um, and actually, I had the privilege of trying zooming at one point with the gaze tracker. And it was the most effortless thing I've ever done, because you just looked, and you're like, I want to go there. And you were there. You look over there, and you were there. Um, so I don't know. Maybe, maybe that? So I have a small question about the zooming interface. Uh, I did some experiments a couple of years ago, and uh, we, had, we didn't have searching. We had uh, just you know, zooming in and out. Yeah. We tried to make, as you said, it's uh, tried to make it a little bit more efficient. So we actually had a uh, throttle that you could, you know, zoom a little bit or zoom a lot yeah. quickly, and we had a nice big screen. Yeah. And many people loved it, but for for certain percentage of people, it made them just queasy and mm. sometimes literally sick because you know a lot of stuff moves in and out very quickly. Uh, I was wondering if you experienced that and if you have any ideas on how to. Um. Every once in a while, I, we haven't really tested it with really big screens. So you get, I've never really seen it where the entire world seems to be moving around you, which I could see being disconcerting. Oftentimes with prior research in Zooey's, um, people start with just the standard zooming. It, by the way, this is, this is an old idea. Um, just like the command line, a lot of these things are really just revamping of old ideas. Um, so. People generally give up very quickly on the idea of just using zooming um, and start adding lots of other things like uh, fish eyes or whatnot to try to solve some of these other problems, which I think can be solved by search. And that certainly, I think, makes people queasy. I haven't so far noticed that people feel queasy with the very simple zoom where you're not doing anything very clever. But it may well be a problem. Smaller screens, though, I think will always be a solution to like, that problem. Hey, um, nice talk. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I was wondering if you have looked at thing called Dasher. Yes. So, uh, are you working towards integrating? I, I mean, the way I see it, it has like a tracking system so that you can type text input, and it's mm. it looked kind of intuitive to me. So, I was just wondering if you have. Um, I mean, I played it. with it, and it's 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 definitely great. Um, I mean, it's intended. It clearly will never replace typing like this, um, but. I mean, I, I, I always balk at the word intuitive, because intuitive generally just means familiar, and familiar is what we've seen before. Um, but it was not hard to pick up. Um, typing things that were not normal, uh, like I tried entering Japanese into it, just, and it didn't like that very much. Yeah, um, there are development going on in that, I guess. Yeah. Um, and it's the same problem with the predictive text input on cell phones. 
And that's something that almost always happens when you try to do predictive things. When the user does something outside the realm of what's predicted, which actually happens fairly often when you're doing anything pathological, like typing in another language, they often fail. Uh, so I'm always wary of things like that. Um, I think people might be wanting to try and wind up this session, not that I'm speaking for the <laughs> organizers, but, I, but um, I, this is sort of a meta uh, comment, okay. really, which would be there's a lot of my colleagues um, outside Google who I'd really, really like to share this talk with, and I'm wondering um, if we can't share this talk, is there some way of you giving us a link to other talks that you've given like this um, so that people outside Google can oh. take advantage of this? Thank you. Um, 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 yeah. Maybe maybe it's possible to, to, to make this one publicly available. I think this um, one is going to be on Google Video. OK, cool. Great. <laughs> so yeah. Good talk. Thank you. So is that it then? Am I off the hook?